Copyright in these lectures is either owned by the ANU or a third party who has licensed the ANU to use it. Students may use the recording for personal study only. No lecture may be communicated online, copied or shared without the prior permission of the ANU. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome here to the Australian National University Energy Change Institute public lecture. Uh, my name is Ken Baldwin. I'm director of the Energy Change Institute here at ANU. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you and to uh, introduce the, uh, the evening. So uh, this is part of our public lecture series that we hold throughout the year, uh, culminating uh, in Energy Update, which is our annual uh, major energy uh, flagship event in uh, late November. Uh, this year it'll be on Tuesday the 29th of November, so we hope to see you all back there then. Uh, when, of course, the International Energy Agency uh, releases its World Energy Outlook and we have uh, a uh, representative from Paris come to uh, give us the latest information. Uh, this evening we have another representative from the International Energy Agency, uh, Cedric Philibert, uh, to speak to us. Uh, but to uh, introduce him, uh, we have from the Australian Solar Thermal Research Initiative, uh, uh, Dr Wes Steen. And Wes will uh, formally uh, introduce uh, Cedric and, uh, and his talk. Thank you, Wes. Uh, hi. Um, uh, last night uh, we had the pleasure of um, meeting with um, our Australia's chief research scientist, Alan Finkel. One of the first things that Alan said to, to Cedric was, uh, so you used to be a journalist, and that surprised me. And I guess um, knowing your background and being interested in your subject is why you get to be chief research scientist of Australia. But um, I hadn't realised, I've known for Cedric for 20 years and hadn't realised he had a journalist background, but it did certainly explain uh, some of the, the seminal documents that Cedric's produced over the years um, uh, at IEA and, and, and before. Um, uh, chances are when you've jumped online to try and find some, uh, some global data, um, uh, something about technology, about renewable technology, something about future projections, it's one of Cedric's documents that you've landed on and thought, this is what I need. Um, uh, really interesting document, so I, I do um, uh, put to you that you, you go and look at the IEA website for that sort of information. Um, the last few days, we've, uh, the CSP community, researchers and industry alike, have met uh, in Melbourne, had some, some great discussions, presentations about where the technology is up to, uh, new advancements, and, and also discussions about where to go. And um, importantly, we've uh, uh, had some, uh, some of our international friends over, not just Cedric, who's going to talk, but um, we have three here tonight. Um, uh, Christian from, from DLR in Germany, Ellen from Arizona State University, and Joe Steckley from the University Department, uh, the uh, US Department of Energy. So uh, we had some fantastic insights uh, from these people um, guiding us, telling us um, where we, we possibly going the, the right direction and also possibly where we're going the, the wrong direction and need to, um, to think about some other things, but importantly, um, where we can collaborate. These are things that other research institutes in the world are doing, um, but there's some gaps here. Why don't you start to work on this and, uh, and, and come together? So really valuable three days. Um, one of the key points that came out is the emerging importance of, of storage. So the, we know the PV juggernaut that's going on. Uh, we, we hear that there's uh, possibly a battery juggernaut to, to come. Um, there are no price signals, really, no market signals in Australia at the moment for storage right now, with oversupply of electricity um, and uh, um, uh, a lot, lot well, um, uh, at, at this point, uh, renewables still less than 10 per cent of the uh, uh, variable renewables, less than 10 per cent of our total mix. But um, if we're going to meet COP21, as Cedric's going to talk about, um, and we're going to have in Australia at least um, uh, significant retirements of fossil fuel stations uh, just due to age, um, we're going to need storage, I would say, big storage in five to certainly ten years' time. And uh, we can't await, afford to wait five years to have the technologies ready. And so uh, one of the, the, the lowest cost forms of storage at the moment is thermal energy storage associated with CSP, concentrating solar power. That's one of the things that I think Cedric will, will talk about tonight. Um, so, um, as, as well as the other renewables. So, thank you, Cedric, and we look forward to your, your talk. Well, 
thank you much. Uh, thank you, Wes. Thank you, Ken, for this nice opportunity to uh, address you. Uh, thank you also, uh, Arena, for the uh, opportunity to be here in Australia and uh, go from place to place and, and uh, meet uh, lots of uh, interesting people and have a lot of interesting conversations. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you want me to speak in the microphone? Uh, okay. What I uh, intend to do is to uh, discuss the uh, perspectives for renewable in a post uh, COP21 world uh, from a, a global point of view, which is that of the uh, International Energy Agency. And I will uh, just uh, start by uh, saying a few words about uh, COP21. We believe it's a historic milestone. Um, it's uh, said to be a binding agreement. Of course, what is binding is only the reporting um, framework. The uh, emission reductions inside are not binding. So it's not like the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, but unless the Kyoto Protocol, it creates this obligation of reporting to all countries in the world. It's universal. It's not uh, a divide. Uh, it goes beyond the uh, former divide between industrialized countries and developing countries. And it, that's important because, of course, the uh, accumulation of the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, well, at least for the CO2 from uh, energy-related CO2, come mostly from industrialized countries, but what's coming next, which is in a, in a way more important because of the emissions we can avoid, well, we cannot avoid the past emissions, the emissions we can avoid will come mostly from the developing countries, the emerging economies, uh, China and, and India and others. So we had to find a framework where we could encompass um, all of these uh, countries, and the agreement is important because it says first we need to uh, reach a peak in the global emissions of greenhouse gases uh, as soon as we can. Uh, but the overarching uh, ar goal is to keep the uh, um, uh, global temperature change since pre-industrial times uh, below 2 Celsius degree and if possible close to, to 1.5 Celsius degree, which is a very demanding objective. And, and for achieving that, we need to reach carbon neutrality, that is to have zero net emissions uh, so that the uptake, natural uptake or artificial uptake uh, of uh, carbon from the atmosphere uh, should uh, balance uh, out completely the uh, uh, gross emissions uh, that we'll have in the uh, second half of this century. So this uh, defines a, a pathway to which uh, all countries are called to contribute with their respective uh, means and possibilities. And indeed, uh, renewables have been important in uh, achieving this agreement and will be very important in uh, reaching the targets. Um, <coughs> renewables are, are explicitly referred to in uh, about 100 of the uh, so-called INDCs, uh, or the pledges that countries have made in the, in the lead to uh, the Paris uh, conference. Uh, we've seen uh, huge uh, renewable capacity additions in the last few years. Uh, which I will detail, and m maybe most importantly, we have heard uh, announcement for uh, lowest ever uh, wind and solar PV prices uh, for plants to be commissioned in the next few years. And all this, we believe, have uh, contributed to incredibly facilitate the conversation in Paris. Um, before, in, in, in the last 20 years, I've been following this uh, conferences since, since COP1. I was in Berlin at COP1 as a French negotiator. Uh, and indeed, the, the uh, discussion has always been about pain, about constraint, about restraining growth uh, and not allowing the developing countries to achieve uh, poverty eradication, uh, energy security, affordability, uh, access. Uh, this has changed in the last few years, mostly thanks to some improvements in energy efficiency technologies uh, like uh, solid uh, lighting, but more importantly, uh, thanks to uh, the emergence of affordable renewables that can substitute to uh, fossil fuel in electricity generation, uh, mostly in electricity generation, and, and that was new. Uh, what we've seen at the same time around COP, not linked to COP, 
uh, is a, a big downturn in prices for all fossil fuels. And this, of course, can be economic opportunities, uh, but it can also be a threat for uh, achieving our goals um, in the next uh, coming years uh, with respect to improving energy efficiency and deploying uh, more renewables. So we'll, um, uh, we'll discuss that at the, at the end of uh, my talk. Uh, so what have we seen in the last few years? In the last uh, uh, six years, we've seen uh, that about half of the new capacity to generating electricity have come from renewables. And uh, uh, two-thirds of that has been um, non-hydropower renewables. The, the light green is non-hydropower renewables. That means basically wind, some bioenergy, but mostly wind and uh, solar PV. And then we have had also a significant increase in hydropower from large plants in emerging economies. And the, the other half, of course, was fossil fuels. Uh, no net nuclear in those six years. Uh, what we foresee for the next uh, six years is uh, significantly different. Uh, first, uh, it will be less addition uh, because uh, the uh, growth of uh, electricity demand has been stabilized in many countries. And second, uh, we'll see that uh, renewables now will account for uh, more than half, uh, almost two-thirds of this new capacity, fossil fuel only a third, a little uh, positive uh, uh, nuclear, the uh, uh, new builds will slightly dominate over the decommissioning. Uh, hydro will be uh, smaller, uh, but non-hydro will represent, uh, non-hydro renewables uh, uh, will represent half the new capacity additions. Uh, that's uh, a shift which uh, announces something, but of course it's not sufficient. If we want to go to a strong decline in emissions, we'll have to to uh, further uh, increase the, the share of uh, renewables in the new capacity additions for the power. Uh, but still, we already have seen uh, a peak in emissions. Maybe it's not the uh, real peak. Uh, maybe it's provisional. We have to be careful. But now it's two years in, r in a row where emissions have been uh, at the same level, a very high level. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, still, before declining, you would have expected a peak, and we may have reached that moment already. Uh, we'll see if this is confirmed uh, with what we foresee for the uh, uh, installation. In fact, to see a peak, we should see no further investment in fossil fuels, except that some of these plants will be just more efficient than the older ones that are going to be decommissioned. So it's not necessarily fully incompatible with the decline in emissions. Uh, but, of course, the higher the share of renewables, the uh, uh, better the prospects for uh, a further decline in emissions. What we also see that the, uh, this net additional renewable capacity now are not being exclusive of uh, Germany and Italy and the U.S. Uh, it's uh, uh, the OECD country, the IA member countries, represent only now a third of these new capacities. China itself alone represents another third. Uh, and the rest of the world, uh, the last uh, bit. Uh, so this means that uh, we at the IEA, we want to open our doors uh, to uh, uh, work more with uh, in collaboration with, with China and other emerging economies um, because the shift has to, is, is going to be global. Uh, it also means that in, in Europe and elsewhere, we have to be uh, careful not to see a decline in investment in, uh, in renewable energy capacities um, while uh, um, it is important that uh, uh, the, the, the whole world goes in the same direction and we cannot now leave that to emerging economies uh, after having uh, hosted the uh, earlier deployments. Uh, what has been very important, as I said, is a decline in cost. Uh, for wind power, it has been 25% since 2010 on the uh, levelized cost of electricity. For solar PV residential, it has been more than 40%, and for utility scale, it has been more than 60% decline since 2010. And we expect that these trends will continue in the coming years, uh, and we base this uh, uh, forecast on the number of signals, market signals, uh, but the, uh, perhaps the most important ones are the uh, uh, announcements that have been made in the last 18 months 
for uh, power purchase agreements uh, through auction systems. And we've seen a bunch of uh, very interesting uh, low prices for wind power, the lowest being in Morocco at 3 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and for uh, utility scale PV plants, we've also seen things going down progressively from 6 cents in uh, the Emirates to uh, uh, 4 cents in Mexico recently in auctions. And even more recently, I showed this slide uh, three days ago uh, in Melbourne, but I have to uh, modify it now because there has been a new announcement and the price in uh, the Emirates that was that made a big buzz uh, eight months ago when it was announced at six has been announced at, announced at three uh, cents. So maybe the price is too low. Uh, maybe it will never be built. You never know with auction. You always have to be a bit careful. Um, sometimes people underbid and then they cannot realize what they have promised. They cannot deliver. Uh, on the other hand, these new plants will have to be commissioned in 2019 and 20, and everybody knows, uh, expect that the cost of PV will be further reduced. I heard yesterday a conference from uh, um, a very knowledgeable person about uh, PV, a certain Martin Green. I'm sure you have heard this name before. Um, and he explained all the uh, determinants of the further cost reduction uh, in the PV industry. Um, so here we are with lots of uh, uh, projects all throughout, throughout uh, around the world. Uh, maybe a few of them will not materialize, but still you, you see that the trend is, is complete, is everywhere. And it, it, it occurs because we have introduced only recently, after years of fill-in tariffs and uh, uh, a lot more competition through auctions, but this competition is not competition on the electricity markets. It's competition for long-term contract, and I think this is very important to uh, be aware of that. Uh, I'm of often asked the question, when will the renewables be competitive? And if the question is on spot markets, the answer is never. Well, it's already there because the, mar the uh, marginal cost is close to zero. So it's ultra competitive on spot markets. But the question is, what do you mean by competitiveness? Uh, it should be seen as a uh, first step as a uh, levelized cost of electricity, or even better, at net system costs. Uh, and even better with uh, internalization of external costs like uh, pollution, air, air quality in cities, uh, or uh, climate change. So you have different metrics possible for competitiveness, and on the electricity market, uh, a plant that is built will come first. The uh, PV and wind will come first. It will be ultra competitive when it's built, but to be to being built, it cannot be built just on the prospects of the competitiveness of the market, because then you will never get back to your investments. You will never get sufficient return on investments. So you have to have a long-term contract. If you don't, you have a big problem. Why? Because it's all capital intensive in the sense that um, a PV plant, for example, this is a PV plant, um, you have uh, almost all the cost has to be paid on day one. And then you have almost nothing to pay. You have very small uh, uh, maintenance and operation expenditures. Uh, so if you have a, a high cost of capital, like 15%, uh, or if you have a low cost of capital, like 5%, you end up with a price LCOEs that are very different. Here, one to two difference. So here you have Dubai with 5% weighted average capital costs. Uh, we know that they have 83% uh, debt at a very low cost, and equity is not very high either. And so they can generate electricity at 6 cents, or maybe now 3 cents, uh, with a good resource, with a good developer, with a sound off-taker, because the bankers are confident in the policy framework. They know that the contract will be respected, and there is a contract for 25 years in that case. So that's the secret of competitiveness. If you don't have a contract for 25 years, if you have a contract only for 5 years or 10 years, uh, if there are lots of risk in the contract, uh, you will get some money, you will raise some capital, but at a very higher cost. And you will end up 
uh, at uh, LCOE that will be twice as high uh, than otherwise. So it's the uh, market and regulatory risk uh, have an enormous influence on the cost of renewables. And sometimes people say, okay, it would be the same for coal plants or uh, gas plant. No, it won't be the same. It will be important also for a coal plant because it, it has a relative amount of capital, but much less so for a gas plant, for example, uh, with the, um, the share of the capital in the total cost is much lower. So the uh, cost of capital, which have much lesser influence on the cost LTOE of fossil fuels. So if we don't accept this idea of long-term contracts, uh, which is a problem in Europe, for example, where the uh, uh, competition directorates of the European commissions tend to fight against long-term contracts because they say, well, it, it's not protecting the consumers. What if the uh, fossil fuel prices go down? Uh, you won't get the benefit of that. Okay. But you will get the benefit of if the prices go up. And they are very low now, so they are more likely to go up than go down. Uh, so you have an interest as a consumer to capture this certainty over the long term, right? Um, but the, the uh, competition director does not accept that. Well, if you don't have a long-term contract, you will end up with much higher costs for your uh, capital-intensive investments in energy efficiency, in renewables. If you want to do nuclear, well, you want to do nuclear, you have to go to 35 years of contract at $100 per, uh, per megawatt hour in, in the UK, right? Uh, 35 years contract because it's capital intensive. It's always the same. There is no uh, energy transition away from fossil fuel without long-term contracts and I think it has to be made very clear. Uh, now let me go to what we need to do in the um, slightly longer term to 20, year 2040. What this is a trajectory of greenhouse gases that we should have from the energy sector and here the uh, trajectory we're on for now. So it's better than it was before. Uh, maybe we have seen this peak, uh, but still factoring uh, what we had, I would say, uh, a year ago. Eh? This is uh, what we had a year ago. We still had a growing trend for emissions and we need to reduce these emissions uh, by about half uh, by the time, by, by 2040. And how we do that? Mostly through energy efficiency and renewables. Uh, here you see a bit of nuclear, you see a bit of carbon dioxide capture and storage, a bit of other measures like uh, uh, upstream uh, methane emissions from the oil and gas uh, sector, but the bulk of the effort has to be renewables and energy efficiency and now it's clear for everybody. I mean five years ago it was clear for some people, but now uh, uh, but now I think it's clear for everybody, at least uh, within the IEA. Uh, if we go just a little uh, farther in the, in the uh, time horizon, 2050, uh, we see that for the power sector we have to be a shift reversal. If we were not acting now, we would go to uh, this 6DS, this absurd uh, counterfactual now scenario where we would have uh, a big uh, doubling of the uh, electricity demand and basically the same structure as of today that is fossil fuel, coal, gas, nuke, uh, then hydro would uh, still continue to grow for its own merit, some wind, some solar but uh, still limited. Um, instead of that we sh have to go for the uh, 2DS or the high renewables in which we have renewables for uh, uh, two-thirds to uh, four-fifths of the global in electricity generation, um, and which means viable renewables, that is what you have on the top, uh, offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar PV, should account for 30 to 40 percent of the global generation. So of course the uh, problems will be different in the various regions, and the, because the resources will be different. In Latin America you will still have a big dominance of hydropower, so no problem of viability. Um, in, um, in very sunny countries, sunny and arid countries, you will have a mix of solar PV and solar uh, thermal power. Uh, thermal power will help mitigate the viability of the solar PV. Uh, in Europe, you will have a lot of, uh, or in northern China, you will have a lot of wind power. And uh, thankfully, uh, hydropower will help mitigate that viability. 
Um, but uh, in some countries in t or part of the world, it will be a, a challenge to go to very high shares of viable renewables, while in other you will have lots of hydro or other options. Uh, this is where uh, uh, CST fits in the picture for a country like Australia, but also Middle East, also North Africa, South Africa, Chile, Mexico, uh, Southwestern US. You have a number of uh, opportunities uh, to uh, generate dispatchable electricity, but also to contribute to the uh, decarbonization of the rest of the electricity mix, of the energy mix, and provide high temperature industrial process heat, but also manufacture energy vectors as solar fuel, which I will explain a little bit. Uh, I know that in Australia you have a lot of PV on your houses now and uh, counting uh, 1.5 million uh, rooftop systems already. Uh, you have a picture from Australia, by the way, because it's uh, uh, one of the few places on Earth where you can find such a big concentration of uh, rooftop PV. You have Hawaii. And then, then you go down to much lower number in Bavaria, some, some places in Bavaria, but that's it. Uh, and here you have a big, uh, a big uh, CSP plant in, uh, in uh, California, in the Mojave Desert. Uh, so, but the, both technologies are really different. PV takes all light, so it can work in northern Germany. Uh, UK is now uh, more equipped than France. Uh, uh, while uh, CSP, or here called STE, solar thermal electricity, takes only the direct light, the light that comes from the sun disks. Uh, PV can be built almost everywhere, uh, solar thermal electricity only in semi-arid countries. Uh, PV is scalable, it can go from uh, the PV on your uh, mobile phone to a uh, gigawatt scale, uh, while uh, CSP is only for utility scale, at least for now. Uh, PV is variable and concentrated around the middle of the day. Uh, the other technology is firm and dispatchable and it's being so thanks to either uh, storage or backup or both. Uh, finally, uh, uh, to develop further the PV you will need smart grids uh, with bi bidirectional uh, capabilities and also flows info in of information that it has to be smartly uh, managed. Um, while for CSP, what you need is very often long lines to bring the uh, electricity to the load centers, which are not necessarily the place where uh, you have the best DNI, so you have a disconnect that you need to uh, manage with uh, long connecting lines. Now, uh, large shares of PV, that will be a, a challenge to integrate. Uh, you see that with the example of, of California. Uh, I guess we could have built the same example here in Australia, but I'm not aware that somebody has already done that. So here is a, uh, a graph made by the uh, um, system operator, independent system operator of California. It's a famous uh, duck curve that shows uh, the, the, the red line uh, over the successive years is the shape of the uh, net demand, that is the uh, demand of electricity net of the PV production. And as, as the PV gets developed, uh, you will end up with a, a, big, uh, uh, a big ramp at the end of the day when the sun sets, which will be a big uh, a challenge for the uh, rest of the system, for the grid, for the uh, other generators, for the entire system, because you will have to go very rapidly from a very low generation uh, base apart from PV to the peak of the day, which is usually after sunset when uh, lights get turned on and uh, everybody gets home. So uh, to address this uh, uh, challenge, we know that there are, we, we have to, to work with a, a range of different means, grid to uh, cancel out the variations, um, and to connect all the uh, possible sources, uh, the f all the possible sources of flexibility and all the demand. Uh, flexible generation, here from a gas turbine, but it could also be from hydropower. Storage, here illustrated with pumped hydro storage, which is still by a, a large margin the uh, most widespread means of uh, uh, electricity storage on grids. And demand side, which is the uh, vast resource which is yet untapped but could help shift the uh, demand to 
a time of uh, glut instead of uh, uh, having the demand in time of scarcity of electricity on the grid. Um, another way of expressing this challenge is to look at the uh, marginal value of uh, electricity from PV systems when they get uh, um, when they access to large shares of electricity. And here you have the uh, uh, a study made by our colleagues from NRL in the in the United States on California with 33 percent of annual energy b coming from renewables and variant with 40 percent of electricity from renewables. And what you see that the uh, value of PV uh, decreases significantly when you go from 33 percent to 40 percent. Uh, by contrast, the value of solar thermal electricity with built-in thermal storage keeps constant or instead increases uh, as long as the value of PV decreases. So uh, today we don't need much uh, CST, but as uh, CSP gets, uh, as, as PV gets more widespread, we will need to have uh, CSP in support to PV and wind, especially when we have to uh, get rid of the old uh, coal and gas plants uh, at some point in uh, not too distant in the future. Um, so we see that uh, at the end of the day, the two solar technologies will be, will complement each other. Uh, we'll have PV uh, because it's the cheapest uh, w during, during the day, around mi the middle of the day. And we basically will have most of the CSP electricity being produced when the sun sets and the demand increases, so we have to fill that gap with uh, some renewable energy sources, and that's what CSP can best achieve, as it's already proving in, in Arizona and a few other places. Um, so this has led to uh, the IEA to reconsider uh, our vision for uh, CSP and uh, PV. I mean, six years ago, we would have said that both technologies will share the market in, in um, uh, equal shares. Uh, we now see that uh, CSP will have a smaller share than PV. As PV is, is getting widespread and much, much more rapidly. Uh, but we still see a need for CSP in the future. Uh, basically, starting really after 2020, uh, when PV gets uh, uh, access to large share in, in many more places, it saturates the, the demand at, uh, at noon. And therefore, there will be need, if you want to have more solar and more renewable in your mix, you will have need to have uh, that through, uh, through CSP um, or PV plus storage. That's also, of course, a possibility. I will compare some of them in just a minute. Um, because CSP only takes a direct light, you will have to uh, uh, install the plants where you have very good uh, direct normal irradiance, so it's not everywhere and some of the uh, uh, demand you have to, uh, to address with uh, long connecting lines. Uh, you may have heard the project uh, Desertec, that is uh, the idea to connect the North Africa, well, it's already connected, but with, with thin lines, uh, to, to strengthen these connections, to have uh, more exchanges, not only export, by the way, but mostly export for, of green electricity from wind and solar in uh, in uh, North Africa to, to Europe and to shoulder the uh, uh, economy of Europe. But there are plenty of other options, including options within Australia or even from Australia to Indonesia, um, maybe. Uh, and of course, uh, big interconnection uh, within the US or Mexico and the US, within China, etc. Um, now, of course, you, you don't only have C so concentrating solar as an option, you also have PV plus battery. Um, although the economics are not there yet, but they are improving rapidly. Uh, it's still a doubtful that P PV plus battery can really uh, provide exactly the same type of services than uh, CSP can do, uh, but there will be a role for that. You also have the challenge with uh, pumped hydro storage. Um, and you see here a big project that is in the Atacama Deserts, where uh, it would uh, help um, a 600 megawatt PV plant to be built. And this 300 megawatt uh, pump hydro storage, which will use the ocean as a source, uh, as the inferior basin, um, uh, and, and be run on seawater, 
uh, would allow to make a generation basically uh, 24, hours, uh, uh, 24 hours a day uh, for the mining industry in that region. Uh, you also see that the good combination, when, when you start injecting renewables in, in, a, in, a, in a given grid, this is a grid in South Africa, a good combination of wind and PV could also approximate uh, the uh, shape of demand not too badly and uh, as long as you, you're in the first uh, persons of the uh, total demand, you don't really care. So you don't need to have immediately the, uh, the CSP. You will have this need over, uh, over some time and hopefully the uh, CSP industry will have reduced its costs since then. Uh, another way of uh, doing things is to associate PV and CSP in the single plants. Um, which are marketed together and also connected uh, together, so you have a number of economies of scale. And this is a, a project for a big CSP plant together uh, that will be linked to PV plants that have already been built in South Africa. And another option, uh, more futuristic, is to combine both technologies in single devices that would uh, be basically CSP plus CPV where one part of the electricity will come from the PV material in real time and another part will be accumulated as heat and so can be generated on demand uh, and together the technologies will uh, be more compact and, and make use of uh, the uh, uh, lighter, uh, uh, broader uh, uh, spectrum of the solar lights. Uh, so what is important is of course the cost and this uh, industry still has to reduce its cost. Uh, when it started in, uh, they, uh, restarted in fact in the middle of the uh, 2000s, it was uh, half the cost of PV, but now it's uh, the reverse. It's PV that costs half the price. Uh, so CSP will not compete P with PV on cost, but it has to be compared with PV plus storage because it has storage. And you have to have a framework that rewards that capacity, uh, which is not uh, obviously the case everywhere. Uh, time of delivery payment, if you have a long-term contract, it has to be structured to uh, reward the uh, capacity to generate electricity on demand and not only when the uh, uh, sunshine or the wind blows. Um, and this is how, in fact, this uh, CSP uh, industry was born uh, with time of delivery payment and how it's being developed further in South Africa, for example, thanks to a multiplier that gives the uh, independent power producers a much better remuneration at the time of the peak, which is uh, basically when the sun starts setting. Uh, so, uh, to conclude with the, uh, this power thing, uh, we, in the short term we, 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 we know apparently where we're going. Um, Renewables used to be basically hydropower, right? Uh, hydropower was 90% of the uh, renewable uh, mix and the renewable share of uh, electric generation was uh, 18% in 2005. Uh, now we are at uh, 22%, uh, so it's increasing and we see that uh, with what we have uh, online in the pipeline, at least we'll be at 26% of the global electricity generation by 2020. Of this, uh, the share of uh, non-hydro renewable will go uh, increase from 10% to a third, basically. Um, something interesting happened already in 2013 that basically generation from renewables uh, topped the generation from natural gas globally and was double that of nuclear power plants. So I think it's an interesting result. You don't always see it in the statistics of primary energy because in the primary energy you account for the heat and PV or wind are not very good uh, on this uh, uh, scale because there is no wasted heat. Uh, but when you look at the real uh, energy produced, which, well, the real energy the useful energy produced, which is electricity, you see that uh, uh, already today uh, the renewables in the world uh, doubles the uh, nuclear. So we see a good uh, forecast for renewable electricity where all efforts have been devoted so far. Uh, policy governments, um, governments have uh, elaborated policies in many countries and, and, and counting, uh, many more are doing that now. 
Uh, we still see challenges for renewable heat and for renewable transport, um, where the growth is much, much smaller, and this really is a problem. If you look at the, uh, um, the plan for of the Europe, uh, European countries to achieve their own target of uh, low carbon, which is 80% decarbonization of their energy mix, you see that obviously uh, just reducing the emission from the power <coughs> sector will not suffice because that's only um, uh, 20, 20 uh, uh, in Europe, it's, uh, it's, a small, it's a small share of the total, and you have to reduce the emission also from industry, from transport, from residential and uh, tertiary sectors. So what's next after power? power? It's probably industry, um, and industry is almost uh, is, is, is heat uh, above all, and heat comes in two different categories, basically low temperature heats that can be reached with solar everywhere, with uh, flat plates, and the new flat plates are very effective. They can go to 100 Celsius degree or above. Uh, but then you have uh, also the, the high temperature levels for industry, which can only be reached in countries that have a good DNI and can concentrate that solar light to achieve uh, high temperature with uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, so you have two ways to uh, increase the uh, share of renewables in the industry. Uh, we at the IA have uh, recently launched a program to, to study that and have recently discovered that uh, ARENA has already launched a program to uh, uh, increase the uh, uptake of renewable e energy in industry and not many countries have uh, really started doing that. So I was <coughs> very happy to discover that. Uh, there are basically two ways. One is through electrification which is the same thing that we're going to do for the transport sector uh, and for the uh, building sector, mostly the uh, uh, substitution of fossil fuel in end users will go, uh, will go through electrification, heat pumps in the building sectors, electric vehicles in the transport. Uh, in industry, we'll of course have one way of doing things through uh, further electrification with a variety of uh, effective and efficient uh, technologies. Uh, the other will be solar heat for industries, and here you see a few uh, examples. This one uh, dates back to 1907 in Egypt, uh, but you uh, see a more recent example in, in India, and there are plenty of examples. Um, the biggest by far will be that plant when it's uh, uh, finished. It's now under construction in Oman. It will serve to inject steam in the, uh, uh, so in the oil fields and uh, help pump out the oil, uh, the heavy oil uh, of the uh, Oman uh, Sultanate. Uh, so you may think, well, it's crazy uh, to pump this, uh, this oil. The fact is uh, we're not going to see the end of oil immediately. And uh, what th these things will do is to avoid burning uh, huge amounts of natural gas to extract the oil from the ground. So it's still a benefit um, uh, from a climate perspective, at least in the next, well, 30 years, the lifetime of that plant. Uh, next step uh, possibly will be solar fuels uh, from hydrocarbon or water, where you will use the uh, concentrated solar heat to uh, uh, make basically hydrogen, maybe heat and electricity together will make hydrogen more effectively. Uh, this hydrogen can be blended with natural gas in the, in the networks. Uh, we had that before at the time of town gas and, and uh, uh, we could be back to some extent to that. Uh, it can also be converted into a number of energy carriers like methane, methanol, uh, dimethyl ether or ammonia and there are also other more complex options. So uh, these fuels can, ideally, they would be liquid fuels that could be put in the tank of, of a car or a truck or a, a, an airplane, um, uh, but uh, they can also be conceived as ways for, I'd say, uh, a large country far away from the rest of the world uh, which uh, would have a big uh, sunshine resource to export part of its uh, solar energy resource to other countries uh, much short in that resource. 
uh, with a way that is not an electricity cable that will uh, span uh, 5,000 kilometers in the sea. Uh, I'm, I hope you have guessed which country I'm mentioning here. <laughs> uh, there are also a number of ways for this uh, solar heat to help manufacture ammonia, steel and cement without the emissions attached to the energy part, but also maybe without the uh, emissions attached to uh, the uh, process. And that will be uh, very, uh, very, very important in to reach the uh, uh, carbon neutrality we've been talking uh, not tomorrow morning, but in the second half of this century. Um, so that would be uh, very, very interesting. It could also support the uh, carbon uh, capture from coal plants, if any, or for biomass plants, you know that to go to 1.5 Celsius degree, some people think we will need to have to go to uh, beaks, becks, uh, the biomass uh, uh, electricity uh, with carbon capture and storage plants that will have negative emissions and generate electricity while uh, taking out of the atmosphere some CO2. Uh, but again, there could be a contribution of solar heat to that. Uh, so with these uh, ammonia or other uh, energy vectors that will help transport the hydrogen not necessarily in a car but to uh, a power plant, uh, an electricity generating plant uh, far away uh, from home. Well, you could uh, reconsider the, uh, the interconnection and to the electric interconnection in the immediate neighborhood. You can go much farther with, uh, with ships and uh, going to uh, to installation in uh, elsewhere in Asia, in Japan, Korea, or China, um, and uh, have new markets for energy products. Um, finally, I would like to say a few words about this uh, threat of the low uh, coal, uh, gas, and oil prices. Um, of course, it's a threat for the energy transition. Um, so, but it's also an opportunity for pricing carbon. I mean, it's, it's the right time for pricing carbon. It was, of course, impossible to uh, get carbon taxes when you had oil at $140 a barrel. Uh, but now we could. And this is precisely the way to keep the oil and gas and coal prices low for the economy while um, raising money to uh, uh, respond to our collective needs instead of uh, taxing the... Uh, the labor or the, the capital. So it makes full sense to tax the bad instead of taxing the goods, right? Uh, when you look where we are, we see that um, we have uh, some countries that have tried to uh, put a price on the, on the carbon, although this price is usually quite low. Uh, it's a collective failure to uh, have kept this price low. Uh, only Sweden has an acceptable carbon price, I would say. Um, you see also that there are many countries that are in fact subsidizing uh, the use of uh, fossil fuels much more than taxing it. Uh, and some countries are both subsidizing and taxing that, that's what you see with these uh, uh, various bubbles. Uh, so there is a lot to do in that, in that direction. Uh, this will not be uh, a way to, how can I say, uh, no carbon price will do the work alone and, and will still need a policy framework for, for renewables that is conducive to investments. But still, a carbon price would help a lot. It, uh, when you look in the short term, you see that the low oil prices are not a threat for the uh, renewable in the uh, um, electricity sector. It's not a threat for the renewables in the short term for the uh, biofuel sector. But it's already a threat for the, re the renewable heat. Um, and, and we see that in the investments, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the difference in investment in uh, renewable heat uh, boilers and uh, fossil fuel boilers for residential in some countries. So uh, uh, it's important now to, to take this opportunity to, to price carbon. We have been talking of that for the last 30 years. Now it's time to, to do it, maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, Still, I, I still want to believe that COP21 COP has been a decisive moment um, that is uh, accelerated a vir virtuous circle that started before, where you have these cost reductions that leads to uh, 
uh, stronger policies, uh, drive to uh, new cost reduction, and so gives new opportunities, etc. And uh, the hope is that COP has uh, uh, coagulated all these uh, things that came from government, but also from industry, uh, mission innovation, from uh, subnational entities, the uh, mayors, uh, from the uh, finance sector that is getting rid of investing in the coal uh, industry, etc., etc., and, and COP is kind of a, a mutual promises that the world has done to itself, its various constituents have done to each other, that we have to walk into that direction altogether. Uh, increasingly affordable renewables are set to dominate the growing power systems of the world. Uh, we need uh, a change in the uh, policy and market design. Uh, in, in up to now, we have been providing lots of financial support, uh, and this has been very instrumental, um, sometimes costly. Uh, so it will remain costly for some consumers in Germany. They will still have 15 years to uh, pay for the uh, big loans for the, uh, for the PV. Uh, it's a gift to the world. <laughs> Uh, cheap PV is a gift to the world, uh, but now we don't need that anymore. Uh, uh, I heard that uh, in some part of Australia today, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the incentive given through the uh, small-scale renewable energy technology targets is not needed anymore. In, in places it would not be needed, in some places still it, it helps, but it's not necessarily needed. Uh, but we have to create a, f a framework for investments, and that's different. For example, in this country, there is no framework for investing in any large-scale plants. And that's a big issue because um, the distributed PV will not do it all. Uh, at some times, the sun will not shine. At some time, you will have wind. You will have neither wind nor, nor PV. So we'll need some flexible uh, and dispatchable resource that has to be based on the, on the sun as well. Uh, so we'll need to, to change things and to... Uh, after some times, maybe uh, shift the money that is being spent on things that do not need to be helped to uh, uh, create frameworks and uh, including uh, financial support f for some time to walk the learning curve for technologies that uh, need uh, to be uh, put in the, in the mix. Uh, Long-term remuneration is crucial. You cannot expect doing that just with the uh, short-term spot electricity markets. And, of course, you need to... Uh, extend the innovation from the technologies to the whole system. Uh, you need to think uh, in a systematic and broad way, and system integration has to is and business models as well are the next uh, um, uh, domains for uh, innovation. Uh, viability of renewables uh, is a challenge, but uh, uh, we're confident that we'll learn to adapt to it. Uh, the viability of policies uh, poses a greater risk. That doesn't mean that all policies should be frozen as they are today, that means that they should be adopted uh, to be uh, clever and also revisable, but in a predictable manner, which is different, and uh, that we should avoid the uh, stop-and-go policy that are very detrimental. Once you have lost the confidence of investors, it takes years to get it back. So you have to be careful in the two brutal changes. Uh, uh, Progressive changes are welcome if they go in the right direction. Uh, they have to be discussed, they have to be announced, they have to be shared with the uh, industry and the stakeholders. And then you can go forward, but you have to avoid the, the brutal things uh, that destroy the, uh, the, the momentum. Um, and finally, the low fossil fuel price are a good time window to introduce robust long-term carbon pricing, ETS, emission trading schemes, uh, carbon taxes, whichever and make progress also, the first thing is to phase out the fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>